Well, Congress MP and Congress spokesperson Shashi Tharoor is in the headlines again after a piece that he's written for the Huffington Post full of praise for India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Now, uh, Mr. Tharoor has in fact since the general election results been quite full of praise for Mr. Modi and his style of functioning and he's taken it a step further in this particular piece. He joins us now uh, for more on why that piece has made headlines here in India. Uh, Mr. Tharoor, you have been, as I said, full of praise for Mr. Modi uh, since the general election results. Result. And in your piece in the Huffington Post, almost effusive in your praise, uh, can we say that you are now officially a Modi fan? No, I'm afraid you can't. In fact, um, I've been a bit intrigued by the uh, paraphrases of my piece that I've seen in the Indian media. It looks like people don't actually tend to read every word and every nuance. Uh, for example, when I said that Mr. Modi is trying to remake himself as an avatar of progress and development, suddenly it says Tharoor says he is an avatar of progress and development. I think there are some real differences here. Uh, but having said that, let me clarify that as the piece very clearly explains, Mr. Modi is somebody who for a dozen years we've had good reason to attack and criticize very severely. Ever since the 2002 riots, his speeches and statements that have followed the positions he's taken, we have been extremely concerned about what Mr. Modi represents and his aspirations and ambitions on coming to Delhi. What has been a pleasant surprise for the likes of me is the way in which he has actually conducted himself and spoken after his election. From the moment of his victory, he has been amazingly gracious and accommodating, particularly in the language of what he has said and in the tone that he has used, and that I felt it would be churlish not to acknowledge, for example, when he says, uh, that he would be Prime Minister of everyone, including those who haven't voted for him, that he would want to serve all Indians, specifically singling out the poor, the sort of constituencies that he has not, in fact, had the support of in the election. It was a clear effort to reach out, and that reaching out, I felt, needed to be acknowledged. But in the same breath, I've said, this may be the evolution of a Modi 2.0, but if Modi 1.0 re-emerges, we will certainly robustly oppose him. The duty of an opposition, it seems to me, is to stand up for the national interest, not to oppose for the sake of opposing everything that the government says or does. Well, your praise for Mr. Modi has actually been welcomed by many who see it as a politics of reason, but it's also drawn some raised eyebrows from others. Now, is this a new form of conciliatory politics that we're seeing that we're not really used to in this country? How do you address the skeptics? Well, I think what we're used to is what the BJP showed us for the last 10 years. The BJP, very sadly, has uh, conducted itself in opposition as a party that felt that the national interest was secondary, the duty to oppose came first. And the most famous example of this is the Indo-US nuclear deal, which they began their negotiations off when they were in power. We successfully concluded it. They then decided to oppose it, while, as we learned from WikiLeaks, telling every American envoy that in fact they supported it, but they had to oppose it for the sake of appearances. Now, that is not genuine opposition. To our mind, that is actually a betrayal of their own principles and of their commitments to the nation and to the national interest. We will not do that. Where we disagree with statements and actions of Mr. Modi, we will not hesitate to say so, and that applies to him, his ministers, his government, and his supporters. As you know, I have been a spokesman of the ICC for the last uh, little while. You've been hearing me saying a number of things that have raised specific issues and concerns. I have raised concerns about the tendency, not of Mr. Modi, but of many of his supporters, to raise extremely sensitive issues, Article 370, the Ill illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, the common civil code. Uh, th th there's issues that are being raised for reasons that we believe have to serve their sectarian interests and not the interests of India, and we have flagged them and we will oppose them strongly. Similarly, I... I right. Can, can I just finish a yeah, couple more yeah, examples? Yeah, sorry, the, sorry, go ahead. The go atmosphere ahead, yeah. of intolerance created by some supporters of Mr. Modi has led to the uh, death of a young Muslim man in Pune, not even the man who posted the Facebook posts that were deemed to be offensive, but merely because he happened to be Muslim and he was attacked and killed. Now... As I said, Mr. Modi is saying conciliatory and accommodative and inclusive things. The message clearly hasn't reached all the way down. And I think it needs to be done if they're really going to be able to change the atmosphere in this country into the kind of accommodative one that I have been speaking for. Well, in your piece, you actually seemed rather very surprised uh, at Mr. Modi's conciliatory avatar. And, you know, uh, you, you've had your own history with him as well. 
Well, I, as you know, I did have my own history with Mr. Modi, and I didn't start it. I mean, it was, um, it was um, a gratuitous insult of my wife that I responded to in kind, uh, I hope in more pleasant language. And, uh, and, 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 and thereafter, uh, in any case, I've had issues with Mr. Modi of substance. I've had issues with his Hindutva message. I've had issues with his failure to apologize for the 2002 riots. And I've had issues as a congressman with the entire Modi-led BJP campaign. So naturally, I've spoken against him for many years. I don't take any of that back. I am saying that what I'm reacting to is the Modi we have seen since the 16th of May. And it seems to me that as long as Mr. Modi says and does these things, it really makes no sense to attack him just for the sake uh, of attacking him. Let us welcome the positive things that he's saying. And the moment he deviates from this, the moment he goes on to an agenda that we cannot accept, let us hit him back robustly and hard in Parliament and outside. But that's the duty of an opposition. I don't think it can be an uncritical and unconstructive opposition because then, frankly, we will lose our, our hold on the affections of the people. At the moment, the people of India have given Mr. Modi a mandate. They want us to give him a chance to do good. So when he's doing good, should we attack him? Or should we actually say, now that you're saying and doing good, we will respect you. The day you go in a different direction, we will hold you to your words of today. But uh, Mr. Tharoor, is your party, the Congress party, okay with this praise of Mr. Modi? Because your innocuous tweets in the past have got you into trouble with the party. So they're okay with this. Well, look, I still haven't been fired as a spokesman, so I'm assuming the party is okay with it. Look, the truth is that uh, uh, the party has various nuances. I think many of the other spokesmen with whom I've discussed this approach have understood it and have appreciated it. I was actually the uh, official briefer for the party yesterday, Thursday, and uh, on that, I'm sorry, Wednesday. And on this day, I actually um, made it a point both to refer to my acknowledgement of Mr. Modi's 2.0 avatar and at the same time to criticize him when I felt criticism was justified, uh, and including, by the way, making the, the remark about his direct meetings with secretaries, which has also made the news today. No one seems to see that you can see all of this as one integrated vision. Our public commentary in the media takes things out of isolation, blows them up in order to create controversies and TRPs. But there is actually a coherent strategy at work here, and I'd be grateful if you would see it. So, so you aren't joining the BJP, are you? Far from it, I think anybody who has sees my 20 years of, of commentary on the nature of India, well before I got into partisan politics, I had a very clear vision of a pluralist India that I was proud to belong to. And I am not persuaded that the majority of the BJP has adopted that kind of vision. I have therefore no reason whatsoever to leave the party that I have uh, contested two elections for, that I speak for, that I'm proud of, and that I believe has made a major contribution to the history of India as well as to its future, now, the you Congress Party. You, you, you mentioned Mr. Modi's meeting with senior bureaucrats, in fact, and, and you tweeted on that, saying that after dismantling the empowered group of ministers, he's cre has he created the disempowered ministers? Now, many ex-bureaucrats and others have welcomed Mr. Modi's move to directly interact with the senior bureaucracy because they believe that this is going to change the way decisions are made in government completely. Look, bureaucrats would welcome it, and one, hope the, one hopes the results are, uh, are, are positive. I do want to stress that I also said that it's Mr. Modi's prerogative. The Prime Minister can meet whomever he wants to. But the point is that if he is going to be doing that, there is a question, a legitimate question that needs to be asked about our cabinet system of government. We have a parliamentary system with a cabinet at the head of it. Each individual minister is supposed to be accountable for the performance of his ministry and collectively for the decisions of the cabinet. Now, if the prime minister is jumping over the minister and going directly to the secretaries, or even lower levels if he so wishes, and taking decisions himself, then what exactly is the significance of the minister? What is the consequence of that for the system of parliamentary and cabinet responsibility? Who should we hold accountable in parliament when we ask questions? to the NDA government? Is the Prime Minister going to come and answer everyone? Or are ministers going to be forced to answer questions on policies the Prime Minister has decided without consulting them? These are all legitimate anxieties that we should have as a responsible opposition, and that's why I'm raising them. Well, speaking of a responsible opposition, now this is a parliament that has an overwhelming mandate for the BJP. And under the circumstances, would you have liked to have seen Rahul Gandhi in particular take on responsibility in the House and lead the party? 
Look, what I would have personally liked to any other individual MP would have liked is, is frankly irrelevant once a decision has been made. We all respect Mr. Karge and we're looking forward to working with him. Let me stress, however, that the Congress is not just the 44 of us in Parliament. I'm proud to be one of the 44 and I hope the 44 will, will be effective enough for five times that number. But the truth is the Congress party is also the party of the streets, the villages, the homes of every person in India. And we will fight the good fight for the values and principles of the party outside Parliament as well as inside Parliament. Inside Parliament, it's clear we're going to have to work very hard, spend long hours and be more effective. And equally that we're going to have to coordinate with other parties that might have opposed us in the election, but can make common cause with us in opposing decisions and policies of the NDA. And that is something we will have to, we'll have to leverage the other parties uh, that, that are also in the opposition. But would it have been better for Rahul Gandhi to have taken on an active role? Now look, I have expressed my views both openly and to the president of the party and the vice president of the party before the decision was taken. Once a decision is taken, as a loyal congressman, my position very clearly is we rally around the leader and we give him our unstinting support. And I'm not going to say anything that's going to detract from that. Meanwhile, I do believe Rahul will be very active right across the country in reviving the party and in working for the party on the ground and in the streets, as we've seen in Badayu already, as we saw in Bhatta Prasad earlier, he is going to be a man of action. You needn't worry about Rahul Gandhi being absent from the fray. All right. Well, let's see what kind of a man of action he actually is. Shashi Tharu, thanks very much for talking to us.